There we go. Hello, guys. Give us one second to make sure everyone makes it in from that waiting room, and we will start rolling. Okay, beautiful. Um, so welcome back. Uh, some of you I do recognize those names, um, but for those of you who are, who are new, uh, we are the Marine Environmental Education Center located out on Hollywood Beach. Um, since we are still unfortunately closed to the public, we are trying to do a bunch of public webinars um, to provide resources to the community since we are still closed. Um, but we are lucky enough to have some really awesome friends in the marine science community that are willing to come out and give really interesting talks. So today we are lucky enough to be working with Larry Wood. Um, he has 25 plus years of studying reptiles in Florida. Um, he is very experienced and he actually established the comprehensive Florida Hawksbill Research Conservation Program in 2004. It's the only one that really focuses in on those hawksbill sea turtles. We talk a lot about those green sea turtles just because we have Captain. She is the star of the show, but those hawksbills are super cool. Um, and he is actually currently working with the National Save the Sea Turtle Foundation, which has worked closely with the Meek since we very first opened. We really appreciate that relationship and that support from them. Um, today, he is going to be telling us a little bit about his research with those Hawksbill sea turtles. Um, if you do have questions, please put them in that chat. If uh, Larry has a second, he will check on it throughout the program, um, but otherwise we'll hold them off till the end and we'll try and make sure everyone gets those questions answered. Otherwise, we are keeping everyone muted just so you could hear him more clearly. Um, but if you do have any questions or if you have any issues, uh, Christina and I are monitoring the chat and we will help as much as we can. Um, so whenever you're ready, Larry, please take it away. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to switch over here to uh, full screen in a second, but I just wanted to thank you guys for having me. Uh, the Meek is a great place. And once we get everything back to normal again, I look forward to come down and saying hi to Captain. Uh, that's a pretty cool turtle. Uh, but, you know, I'm a Hawksbill guy, so we're going to have to switch gears a little bit here, but we still love our green turtles anyway. Uh, well, hopefully this will come in okay for you guys. Uh, but yeah, what I'd like to do for you guys today is talk a little bit about our unique little hawksbill turtles and some of the things that I've been doing over the years to learn a little bit more about them. And uh, hopefully, of course, help them out because like all the other types of sea turtles we know about, uh, they are pretty rare, you know, these are threatened and endangered species, uh, which means that they kind of need our help uh, to get back on track. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so uh, very quickly, um, hold on, let me see if I can get the uh, next slide here to go. No, it decided not to for some reason or another. We didn't practice this part ahead of time, did we? There we go, did it come there through? Yeah. Yep, okay. it looks good. Yeah, there it is. I just need to click the mouse instead of the click keyboard. Uh, so yeah, uh, so the foundation that I work for, uh, briefly mentioned, we like to thank them because they're pretty much responsible for uh, allowing me to do this work and other projects around the state. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the foundation was uh, founded back in the 80s uh, by some people living down in the Keys who kind of realized that some of their environments that they were enjoying were kind of becoming degraded with uh, trash and pollution and stuff. And so they found that their uh, friends in the marine industries with boats and uh, marinas and things were very interested in helping them establish a way uh, for us to start cleaning those problems up. And so the foundation began uh, just as a way to help raise money for people uh, like myself and others to, to do projects that relate to sea turtles and the environments uh, in which they live. So I'm real happy to be with the foundation and they are um, very helpful. And as of course, you know, or we mentioned, uh, we very much like the, the Meek uh, program down there. And of course the Broward County Sea Turtle Nest program. So we're very happy to support them. And when they go out and count the turtle nests out there on Broward County's beaches. Uh, but today what I'd like to do is switch gears a little bit and talk about hawksbills. Uh, I want to quickly remind you that there are five different kinds of sea turtles that live nearby Florida. Now we hear mostly about the loggerhead turtles and the green turtles and the leatherback turtles because they're the ones that come up onto our beaches uh, and lay their eggs every summer. But there are two other kinds of turtles in the ocean nearby that don't usually do that. Uh, maybe they do now and then, but not normally. So that's uh, one of them is called the Kemp's Ridley 
And so we see them mostly on the west coast of Florida and up by the panhandle up there. And then we have our hawksbill turtles, which are the ones we see mostly over here on the east coast of Florida. And what I thought was interesting when I started studying them many years ago was it seems that they like to live here, but they don't like to lay eggs on the beach here. <laughs> so that was kind of an interesting question that I wanted to see if I couldn't find some answers to. Uh, but a little bit about what the hawksbill turtle is, is that um, they are not as big as some of the other kinds of sea turtles. So they get to be about 150 pounds or maybe 175 to 200 pounds, but they're not as big as those big five and 600 pound greens and loggerheads. And uh, hawksbills like to eat sponges. So their ecological niche, we call it, and, and how they separate their resources from the other species of sea turtles is because they like to eat a specialized thing. So green turtles like to eat sea grasses mostly and loggerhead turtles like to eat crabs and lobsters and shellfish and leatherback turtles like to eat mostly jellyfish. So the hawksbill fits into another part of the environment by mostly eating sea sponges. And uh, sea sponges are very commonly found on coral reefs. So you can imagine that's where we find most hawksbill turtles all around the world are associated with coral reef habitat. So we really don't find them too far north of the equator because as farther north you go, the fewer coral reefs we have. But uh, Florida is, uh, does have a nice reef along our coastline, so uh, we qualify. So uh, hawksbills are around here. Uh, kind of the cool thing about them too is that they have a different kind of shell than the other types of turtles. Uh, they're, all those little plates on the backs of their shells overlap one another kind of like shingles on a roof maybe. Uh, so one kind of overlaps over the one behind it. And that's one of the distinguishing features of this kind of turtle. And uh, they have really, those little plates that on the back are called scoots. And uh, in hawksbills, they're very thick. Uh, they continue to thicken throughout the turtle's lives, which is a little different than the other types of turtles. So they end up with very strong and thick armoring on their backs. And they also have kind of points around their rear end there. So they're very, very well protected as it pertains to the armoring of their shells, they're very sharp and very hard. So, you know, we guess that's probably a way uh, to defend themselves against predators. Uh, and then unfortunately, a byproduct of that uh, feature of their shells is that uh, these turtles have been hunted now for centuries uh, because of the value of that shell. So all those scoots are happen to be very pretty and they can be polished and molded and used by artists and tradesmen and others who create all different types of personal products uh, for people which over the centuries have been very popular which means that there is a very large market for this product and so that's one of the reasons why we have so few, few hawksbill turtles in the world today and why they're considered to be a critically endangered species. So uh, it's kind of a bummer about that, uh, but we do hope and we know that around the world, the overall desire and trade in this product has decreased, uh, though it still continues to some degree. So we hope that will land entirely someday. Uh, so let's see, I first became interested in hawksbill turtles uh, as a scuba diver and I would dive around our reefs here and we would notice there are lots of different kinds of turtles we would see. And I noticed that one of the kinds of turtles that I would very commonly see when I was scuba diving were hawksbills. And so I kind of looked up to see if anybody else had done any reports or other, uh, had, you know, maybe some knowledge about how many hawksbill turtles they had seen or whatever. And so I came across some historical records by a lady who was a kind of a well-known scuba diver here in Palm Beach, uh, who scuba dove on our reefs almost every day, uh, all the way, gosh, all the way through the late 70s, through the 80s, 90s. So she had lots and lots of information about the different kinds of turtles she was seeing, and even what their sizes were and how much they grew and what they were eating. So even though she wasn't a scientist, she was just somebody who was real interested in what she was seeing. So I kind of got some background information. So I thought, well, maybe I can try to go out and do maybe the same thing. So 
what I decided to do was see if I couldn't go out scuba diving and try to count and learn more about this particular type of turtle who, as I mentioned before, seems not to like to lay eggs on the beach, but sure likes to live on our reefs. So I started going out there scuba diving and I had many questions I wanted to ask of these turtles. And I'm not gonna get into all of these, but the idea was to learn as much as I could about what was up with the hawksbill turtles here uh, where I was scuba diving, uh, mostly in Palm Beach County here in Florida. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, we have five different species of turtles that uh, can at one time or another be found swimming around Florida. Uh, Florida happens to be a great place for sea turtles because there are so many different kinds of habitats. So if you go to the west coast of Florida, you've got all kinds of mangrove islands and uh, Florida Bay has all kinds of seagrass beds. Uh, certainly we have the Gulf of Mexico, which is lots of deep water with lots of jellyfish for leatherbacks. And then you come around to the east coast and we have one of the busiest nesting sites in the whole world. Uh, we end up with somewhere around 100,000 turtle nests per season every summer here in the state of Florida, all added up together. Uh, so it's a great place to learn about sea turtles. And we also happen to have this special little coral reef uh, that stretches down uh, along the southeast coast of the Florida, uh, pan, um, not Panhandle, southeast F uh, Florida Peninsula, all the way down through Key West. And so even though it's not the biggest reef in the world, uh, it is a pretty productive reef that lines the whole stretch of the Florida Keys all the way up through Palm Beach County. Uh, which provides the habitat uh, that the hawksbill turtles need. And so the kinds of reefs we have are, were created uh, tens of thousands of years ago, a little different than the kinds of reefs you might find in Australia and other places, but Florida uh, has kind of become larger and smaller over the last thousands of years based on how ice ages have come and gone. But most of the reefs that line Palm Beach County were formed between uh, 20 and 12,000 years or so ago and uh, lost uh, some of their abundance because unfortunately an ice age occurred about 12,000 years ago and kind of drew the water away. And so the reefs were left high and dry. Uh, but since then, when the earth warmed again and the ice ages ended, back came the water and covered up all those old reefs. So we've got old reefs that are now kind of rebounding. So they're comparatively young from the reef standpoint. Uh, so these reefs that we're diving on now have been around between five and 10,000 years or so. Uh, so when we went out scuba diving, we would use our friends that run uh, scuba diving charter boats because most of the turtles we were finding were in excess of 40 feet below the surface. So we found that here in our area, the most efficient way to go looking for them was on scuba uh, rather than snorkeling. Uh, we do, however, when we go to the Florida Keys and find shallower reefs, we can use snorkeling instead. But usually we go scuba diving for the turtles and then we find them underwater and we hope that they allow us to get close enough to capture them and bring them to the surface. Uh, one thing that's nice, I guess, if we call it that, had about this study and about hawksbills is that they tend to be more tolerant of our approach underwater than the other species and tend to get let us get a little bit closer to them than the other species do uh, which then allows us to hand capture them and we very carefully then uh, bring them up to the surface and put them on a boat and then once they're on the boat we do a variety of standard measurements and tagging techniques we want to make sure that we know which turtles we've already tagged and which ones we haven't. So we want to put little numbers on them so we can keep track of them. So each of the turtle, turtles that we capture gets a little flipper tag on each one of its front flippers. And also a little microchip thing like you might use nowadays, veteran, veterinarians use for dogs and cats. And that allows us to keep track of which turtle is which out there. And then after we gather a bunch of measurements, uh, we also then take a variety of photographs and we take a variety of different samples of either blood or tissue or shell or whatever, depending on what types of studies we would like to do. So sometimes we might use the blood to learn about their overall health or maybe if they had ingested any contaminants or I uh, used the uh, blood samples to determine whether they were boys or girls because it was difficult to tell from, their, uh, from the outside. 
And so we use various samples. Uh, also, we use their DNA. So we take a little sample of their skin to, uh, for DNA and their shell for other things. So uh, the idea is to gather as much information as we can uh, while we have the turtle in hand. And then we get some nice photographs and uh, from all different angles, the top and the bottom and the sides, and then we let the turtle go. Uh, oftentimes people ask me when they see the photographs uh, what those uh, white spots are on the turtles. I'm sure many of you can guess, uh, but those are barnacles. And the barnacles are little crustaceans that basically are hitchhikers on the backs of the turtles. Uh, they don't seem to do much harm. Uh, unless for some reason there becomes an excessive population on the backs of the turtles, but that's pretty unusual. So most of the time they're just hitchhikers that take a nice ride on the backs of the turtles. And uh, interesting, we're finding out that some of those barnacles are specialized uh, to that type of turtle. So like different species of barnacles will like hang out on different species of sea turtles kind of exclusively. So uh, we're learning about that kind of thing as we go as well. Uh, and then sometimes uh, I was interested in learning about how they moved and where they went. As you can imagine with an animal that lives in the ocean, um, especially in deep water, it can be really difficult to follow them around to find out maybe what their daily routine was or maybe if they were going to migrate somewhere or maybe if they, they had a different place that they were foraging versus where they were eating or whatever it may be. So the best thing we can do nowadays is to stick a little satellite transmitter onto their backs. And so it's kind of like carrying a little cell phone on their back. So every time they come up to the surface to get air, uh, this little device gathers all kinds of information about uh, the coordinates or you know, where the location of the turtle is. And it will tell us how uh, deep the turtle had been on its most recent dive. It'll tell us about the temperature so we can gather a bunch of information about where the turtle is living and what it's doing. Uh, so what did we learn after all this? Well, we've been at it a while now and we're starting to get some good information. And first of all, I guess was, uh, I was surprised as others that uh, Florida is a kind of a better thought than, or a better place for them to live than we had thought. Uh, I didn't think that we would find as many hawksbills as we have. So we're very excited to find out that Florida is an important place uh, for these animals regionally. And that gives us all the more interest in preserving these habitats. Um, the hawksbills seem to be spread across uh, all of our reefs, all the way from Key West, all the way up through Palm Beach County here. So it's great to see that they're utilizing this long stretch of reef uh, in, in pretty good populations. Uh, we've learned, uh, this is kind of a, a chart graph thing. I don't want to bore you with this, but uh, what this tells us though, this is how when we take all the measurements of the turtles, it tells us a little bit about what life stage they're in. You know, we know that obviously a turtle starts a little hatchling and then it ends up an adult. Well, there's going to be a process of growth in between there. And with sea turtles, we kind of know at what size they become adults. You know, so they're youngsters for a while, they're like teenagers for a while, and then they become adults. Well, as it turns out with hawksbill turtles, when we measure their shells, they have to be right around 70 or 80 centimeters or a couple of feet long uh, before we consider them to be adult sized. And what we found around Florida is that the vast majority of the ones are smaller than that. So what we've learned is that Florida has uh, kind of a refuge for what we would call teenager turtles that are not old enough or big enough yet to be reproducing on their own. So it seems that one of the reasons we don't have too many nests or really any nests in Florida is because we don't have adult ones hanging out on our reefs. These are mostly youngsters that one day will be old enough to lay their eggs, but not quite yet. And so we've learned that by looking at their growth rate, and it's probably about 20 years of time that any little hawksbill turtle may live in Florida between uh, by the time it gets old enough to go lay its own eggs. And in fact, the other day I got um, some information about a turtle that I had tagged back in 2008. And so we were able to capture the turtle again the other day. And so we were able to kind of backtrack through its uh, life history and uh, we realized that the turtle had probably arrived here in Florida 
in the early 2000s and is almost ready uh, to leave our waters as a young adult. Uh, so where do they come from originally? Well, we all know that if the hawksbill turtles that we find in our waters were not born in Florida, they must have come from beaches elsewhere in the region. And we also know that sea turtles are really good at remembering where it was that they were born themselves, so they can go back as adults and lay their own eggs there. So we were very curious as to, to know as to to where some of the hawksbills that we find in Florida originally came from. And so this map is showing you that about 80% of the turtles that we have in Florida came from the Mexican, uh, the peninsula called the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, which kind of sticks out into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, about 5% of them come from Central America down in Panama and Costa Rica and Nicaragua, places like that. And then and we've got about 15% of them that come from out in the islands, uh, everything from um, all the Leeward Islands, like the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, uh, Grenada, places like that. So uh, anyhow, it's kind of interesting that we have a melting pot of little hawksbills from around the Caribbean, uh, but most of them are probably coming to us out of the Gulf of Mexico after they hatch in, off of the beaches down in the Yucatan Peninsula. So then we wanted to know a little bit more about, uh, as I mentioned with the satellite tracker, uh, how, how big their, like their neighborhood was. <laughs> so we know that they came from somewhere far away, but we also know that we would see the same turtle over and over again many times when we would go scuba dive in the same locations. And we kind of had this idea that maybe they had like a little territory or like a little neighborhood that they lived in. And so we put the satellite trackers on their backs to find out a little bit more about that. And uh, as it turns out, they, they do have a little neighborhood or we call it a home range is usually the word we use. Uh, that really doesn't go very far out there. So I guess the best way to put it is any little turtle that you see living on the reef doesn't generally go like more than a mile <laughs> away uh, from where it likes to hang out, you know. And so then we looked even more closely and uh, these are going to be a little bit confusing, but we also learned that they kind of have a favorite spot that they like to sleep in every night. So even though they may go out during the day and cruise around the reef and eat this and swim there and swim there, every night they return to their favorite spot on the reef to go to sleep. And so that turned out to be really cool. Uh, we found that most of those spots offer some kind of protection. So we found that things like shipwrecks and rock piles and ledges and caves in the reef were by far the favorite sleeping spot of our hawksbill turtles. And so they kind of shared their daytime territory with each other. So like one could go into another's territory and they could feed and forage, but they, they weren't really sharing uh, their spot to sleep at. So they very much like to hang on to their favorite spot to uh, sleep at night. So uh, to quickly sum up, um, we've learned that uh, hawksbills do come from a lot of different places in the Caribbean. So we have a regional impact on that those animals that are growing up in Florida, we can protect because they're going to leave Florida again and return to their own populations and add on to the next generation. So we know that Florida now has a uh, piece or we're like a piece of the puzzle, you know, in the Caribbean region. And now we know uh, how important our piece of the puzzle is. Uh, certainly, we now know a little bit more about how we can manage our, our reefs and environment locally. Uh, we know that these reefs are important to these animals and we know the types of things that they need to be successful. Uh, so when we learn about how we can enhance the health and well-being of our reef ecosystems, we can keep uh, the turtles in mind. And of course, we all know that Sea turtles are great ambassadors for conservation. Uh, so, you know, sea turtles are very charming things. <laughs> People like them very much. And when we talk about protecting an environment, if sea turtles are there, well, people are more prone to want to protect that environment. Uh, so we're very happy to have our ambassadors help us out because, of course, we all know that coral reefs are extremely valuable and diverse ecosystems. Uh, that are very important uh, to the very bottom of our food chain and environment in the, in the marine environment, very important. Uh, 
Uh, we're hoping to track the turtles a little bit more closely. Um, I'm not going to get into too much of the uh, weeds here, but some of our future studies are going to be about how the turtles arrived from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and how they moved along our coastline. So we're using a variety of different uh, things um, that the samples of their blood and their shells tell us a lot about what they've been eating and uh, where they may have been hanging out over the last number of years or so. So we're looking forward to that study. Uh, we're gonna learn a little bit more about their health. Uh, whenever we go to the doctor and they take a blood sample, they make sure that you're healthy. You know, well, we'd like to know the same thing about these guys. Uh, when you take a sample of a turtle, we don't know like what's normal and what's not really for hawksbill turtles. If there was maybe one going into a turtle hospital or a veterinarian that needed help, it's hard to reference anything. The doctor doesn't really know what's normal, good or bad or whatever. So we're gonna try to put together a report that it shows what it's like to be a healthy hawksbill turtle out there in the wild. Uh, we're gonna learn more about all the things that live on their shells. And we're also gonna learn a little bit more about how they interact with each other. Uh, as I mentioned, they're sharing their habitat with each other, but they're not sharing much about where they like to sleep. So we're interested in about how they communicate with each other um, sea turtles aren't really known to being social animals, uh, but we may be surprised. And I think we're going to learn that uh, these animals interact with each other a little bit more than we have suspected. So uh, we're looking forward to all those things. And then uh, lastly, I'd like to thank all the people and uh, supporters that have made this all happen over the years. Uh, I started this project back in 2004 and uh, can't be done just all by myself. So all the dive operators and volunteers and foundations and especially the National Save the Sea Turtle Foundation uh, have been absolutely fantastic to uh, keep this project going. So um, with that, um, I will uh, take your questions if we can figure out how to do that. I hope we can get me back to the regular screen here. Yeah, if you stop sharing your screen, you should be able to click the chat box at the bottom um, and easily see what people have been typing. If not, Christina and I could read to you. Yeah, the, uh, it was funny because I was full screen too. So what I'm trying to do is get my slideshow to disappear. <laughs> and now uh, it's working on it. I mean, hopefully it will. I have that little spinny wheel, you know, so I know the computer's trying to do something. That's fine. If you want, I can start reading some of the questions off. Yeah, if you can't see me, so what? At this point, I can still answer the question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, let's see. How many turtles have you tagged over the years? Uh, two, I'm at 249. Wow. How, how many years has that been? Uh, since 2004. Oh, there we go. I'm back. <laughs> Yay. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it was. I started back in uh, 2004. So yeah, and as of the other day, I got up to turtle number 249. Uh, but then again, it's, uh, it's kind of only me doing this. So I, even though that doesn't seem like a lot of turtles for that length of time, uh, I don't have a team of researchers and all that that are doing that stuff for me. So it's kind of pretty much as opportunities allow me to go out into the ocean to do that. Yeah. Um, what is the biggest threat to the hawksbill off the Florida coast? Is there still a significant black market for their shells around here? Uh, not around here, but uh, Cuba is not far away. And uh, so we know that uh, hawksbills move around, especially as adults. So they may be protected closer to Florida, but they may not be quite as protected in nearby countries. Uh, but the original question is probably a discarded fishing line and and trash on the reefs. Um, hawksbills are known to really forage along the bottom out there. And when people, uh, not really on purpose usually, but anyway, whenever all fishermen, you know, out there on the reef, and if the line breaks or whatever, there's a lot of fishing line that ends up out on the bottom. So hawksbills are very prone to getting uh, trapped in, in fishing lines. So that's kind of one of their main main problems around here. Let's see, how many locations are you tagging in and do you have a favorite place? Is there one spot that's more dense than others? I've tagged uh, hawksbills all the way between uh, basically Martin County, which is a little bit north of Jupiter, all the way down through uh, the Key West into the, I haven't, uh, Marquesas basically. Um, and so probably the coolest 
are probably the reefs offshore of Key West uh, for snorkeling, but up here for diving, probably Palm Beach, South Palm Beach is the, my favorite for diving. Um, is there a reason that the hawksbills are so much more approachable that they'll just let you hand capture them? It's uh, interesting. Uh, it may be because of their uh, overall behavior. Uh, as I mentioned in the program, they, uh, they seem to be better armored than the other species. So uh, we're not, you know, I can't say for sure, but it seems that, you know, animals who invest in armoring tend not to be the ones that are the fastest runners. It's almost like, you know, a porcupine doesn't really have to run really fast because it's using a different defense than a, a rabbit. Like, so the rabbit, he's all soft and fuzzy, but he has to run fast, you know? So I'm wondering if maybe because the hawksbills are a little bit spinier and tougher and they're putting more energy into building a tough shell, maybe they don't put as much energy into swimming away real fast, <laughs> you know? So not sure, but that, that could be something that we'd like to look at a little bit more closely sometime. Very cool. Um, I don't see any new questions just yet. If you do have a question, throw it in the chat. If you're having trouble with the chat, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, here we go. How many locations, oh no. Do you see defensive behaviors over the sleeping spots that you've seen, or is there something you're still looking at? Is that right? So, good question. Uh, we've been trying to gather images, videos. Now, the hard part about that is remember that not only does the person have to be there with the video camera on, but the interaction has to be happening, and the turtles have to also be ignoring the person who is taking the video, right? So, it's not easy to come across uh, those uh, videos, but guess what? As usual, there's always a few of them lying around. So what I've been able to do is gather some of these videos and some of them are really cool where the turtles, like there's three different ways they interact. One is where they come up to each other like really slowly and it's really funny, but they like put their beaks together like birds. Like, you know, they kind of come up and they like wiggle their heads and like touch their beaks, like the ends of their, their faces, like, like they're kissing or something. It looks kind of funny. And then uh, other times they come up to each other and they kind of circle around each other and like kind of size each other up and like maybe one opens its mouth like a little bit or they try to almost kind of bite the other one's rear flipper or something while they're circling around. And then one of them kind of swims off. And then the third one is where one of them just like totally swims up to the other one and just like rams it and with like full on and with the mouth open and everything telling the other one to get the heck out of there. So there's like three different ways so far that we've seen that we're hoping to, to get more of that as we go along. Yeah, we want to glue some um, cameras on their backs. That's our next plan is to develop some little GoPros that will stick on their backs so we can kind of get an idea of what they're doing from the turtles viewpoint. It's just a personal question that's not in the chat, but can you mount GoPros near like prominent sleeping sites? Have you guys tried that? Sure, that's one way to do it. But you know, again, it's if you have to be, uh, everything has to work out perfectly. Everything has to happen in frame uh, and so on and so forth. And plus it's the ocean. So you've got every kind of condition you can think of out there, uh, even to the point where within hours, algaes and other things start growing on your lenses and all that. So, I mean, it's doable, but there are definitely challenges. So what we wanted to do is stick our little cameras on the turtles themselves, you know, in such a way that they're really kind of low profile and they won't bother the turtles too much and get us a good view of what the turtle is seeing. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, but that's, you know, we're hoping to do that for sure. That's awesome. Um, what can we do to make this area safer for hawksbills? Well, it's really about protecting the reefs, and I know that's kind of a vague answer, <laughs> uh, but let's say uh, per, for sure, if you're out fishing, uh, don't leave your fishing line out there. If you're a snorkeler or a scuba diver, pick up fishing line while you're out there scuba diving or snorkeling. Uh, but otherwise, uh, remember that even things like all the, the runoff that we have from our freshwater lakes and things that go onto the reefs, it's very important that we just take an environmentally protective stance, you know, and that can be with how you conduct your life. It can be with how you vote. It can be all kinds of things. And then there are other people that want to go volunteer, you know, there are all kind of cleanup groups out there and other places like the Meek and others when, of course, everything gets back open and back to normal. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to go out there and do beach cleanups and reef cleanups and all kinds of things that, that people can do. So 
it, it's like mostly about kind of a living a, a environmentally friendly lifestyle. And whenever you find the chance, go put a few hours in somewhere doing something positive. Sorry, do they use the spikes on the back um, by their tails for defense? Very cool question, Zendi. Well, it's, it may not be as that they use them as a weapon, but it, it seems as if they're, they're pretty, you know, if I was a predator, I would consider them to be less uh, appetizing uh, than that nice little green turtle that doesn't have any spikes on its rear end. You know what I mean? So when the predator is making a choice, it has to determine what risk is involved with whatever its choices are. So the idea behind the spikes isn't you to necessarily go up to a predator and hit them with them or anything. No, the idea is to say, look, predator, if you come and bite on me, you're going to get a bunch of spiky things in your mouth, you know, so that's the idea. Yeah, not fun for the predator. Uh, let's see, how many kilometers does a turtle swim each day? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's not much more than a, well, of course, <laughs> there's the straight line and then all the wiggling around, you know what I mean? So if you were to wear like one of those Fitbits on your, uh, you know, walking around the yard, you may get a lot of steps in, you know what I mean? But you're not going far. So uh, I can tell you from the maps, though, that they don't really go much more than about a mile or just in kilometers, it'd be a couple of kilometers uh, during any day's typical activity. Uh, but that's in one direction or another f from, it's almost like you and I, like, you know, we have our home and then you get up and maybe go out to the store or go to do whatever, but you kind of come back to your home base again. So they don't go much more than about a mile from their favorite spot, even though while they're out and about, they may be doing different things. Uh, do you know if the home base, uh, sort of action is similar across species or is it specifically a Hawksbill thing? Well, we are finding that uh, other species like refuge, especially green turtles, they will seek out refuge, but it may not be the same spot. What we're finding with the hawksbills so far is that they're staking out a particular one that they're very consistently returning to. And so far, that seems to be what the interesting part is. Uh, other species may go and hide under something, no problem to go to sleep at night, and that makes sense. But it's, uh, this seems to be a little bit more was structured uh, as a behavior than the others. Almost uh, for the little bit more science-y people, it's almost like a roosting behavior. Other species do it, so butterflies, bats, all kinds of species uh, perform, uh, of course, birds, uh, what we call a roosting behavior, where a whole group have to kind of go hang out, but they all kind of know where their spot is. And there happen to be better spots than others even if we don't know what that means, but they do. So if you're a bird on a, on a wire, there's gonna be some spot that they figure the best. So they're gonna have this hierarchy. It says, okay, well, this is my spot and that's yours. And so it's kind of a behavior where there's an agreement amongst the group uh, that even has to be sometimes, uh, you know, contested or fought out a little bit, I guess, you know what I mean? But um, I think that's what's kind of going on. Very cool. Um... Why do the hawksbill not nest in the Florida area? What type of habitat are we missing? It turns out that hawksbills prefer uh, very uh, skinny and uh, what you call very forested type of beaches. Uh, Florida has much wider open ocean beaches. We have open wide sandy beaches. Hawksbills just really don't like open wide sandy beaches. So uh, they much prefer uh, little pocket beaches and coves and islands and things. Uh, the uh, Yucatan Peninsula has a lots of, we were talking about those uh, habitats down there, lots of mangrovey type of islands. Uh, you can imagine like in the Bahamas, all those little islands, you know, that they have by the hundreds out there with all those little beaches off in the corners and all with, uh, and the hawksbills like to go up into the bushes and under the, um, kind of the edge of the forest to uh, lay their eggs. So it's a little different than the other species. And that's probably why they don't really like to nest in Florida. Very cool. Um, and do the sponge spicules from their diet affect predators at all? Well, that's a possibility. Uh, very few things can safely eat sponges, uh, because, partly because they are made of those spicules, which are the, what is for the rest of everybody, that's what the skeleton of a sponge is made up of, these little tiny uh, like 
glass particles <laughs> that would otherwise are really bad to eat, like really bad for you. So there's only a few types of marine animals that even bother to go anywhere near that stuff. And so it turns out hawksbill turtles have adapted to that uh, lifestyle and like to eat sponges. So yeah, if, if I were a predator and I swallowed a hawksbill, I would also get whatever the hawksbill ate and so uh, eating sponges itself is a very good question as to how and why they may have adopted that particular lifestyle, but that is a very good possibility uh, that being uh, something that is eating something that's really bad for you may help in, in an anti-predator strategy. It's not maybe a coincidence that they are also the most strikingly colored of the turtle species through their lives. And we do know that nature has shown us in other places that uh, very strikingly colored animals are kind of show-offs, partly because they may be showing off uh, their poisonous nature. So, you know, can't say for sure, but some of the clues that we have out there point to the possibility that the spongivory itself could be an anti-predator adaptation, but uh, tough to say. Good question though. Very cool. I think that's our last question. Um, but if you do think of more, feel free to throw it in the chat or if we don't answer it, email it to us at meek at nova.edu. And if we can answer it, we will send along to Dr. Wood because he knows all of the Hawksville things. Um, but otherwise, thank you so, so much for coming in and giving this presentation. It was really cool. Learned a whole lot about Hawksbills. We don't get to talk about those a lot. Well, you're very welcome. Glad to be here, for sure. Yeah, we love our little hawksbills. <laughs> Otherwise, um, if you missed the beginning of this program for any reason, it is recorded. We're posting it on our YouTube channel. Um, that will probably take a day or so for us to edit it and post it up there. Just look up Seek the Meek on YouTube for us. Otherwise, this Thursday at 1 p.m., we are talking to Jessica Powell all about dolphin biology and conservation. Um, so we are jumping away from turtles for a little bit and talking about those marine mammals. Oh, Sydney, that's a very cool picture of a hawksbill you drew. Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> that's fantastic. Beautiful. Awesome job, guys. Thank you for coming today, and we will see you on Thursday. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.